to state to state my thesis right at the beginning categorically, I recommend that unless there's some physical disability or physical problem, every clarinet player should learn to play French embouchure and should work on it periodically. Now, the reasons for that I'm going to outline a little bit later, but let me give you a little background on the history of French embouchure. First of all, the greatest French clarinet players of the early part, late part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, were French embouchure players. And if you listen to their old recordings, the playing was spectacular. Um, and also, they had a vision, the, those clarinet players who wrote for the clarinet, show us a vision of the clarinet, its flexibility, its dynamic range, its agility, its beauty in long sustained passages that, frankly, I really don't hear much anymore with the playing that goes on. Even people who are technically proficient, who get over the horn very well, um, this uh, quality of sound, the uh, liquid quality uh, that is yet well-defined, resonant, and yet has full body through up, throughout the register, it, I don't hear that. I really don't hear that. Uh, so in, as impressive as some of the technical achievements uh, that some have made and some present, very uh, impressive. Uh, but the truly artistic things, phrasing, um, beauty of sound, beauty of legato, uh, I don't know, it falls kind of short. And for me, the modern example of that, and you know, in a kind of, in a way, a kind of um, fulfillment in terms of the evolution of French embouchure playing was Harold Wright. Unfortunately, the French school itself abandoned French embouchure playing, so most of the French players themselves don't play French embouchure. In fact, I can't think of any that do. But, okay, so uh, besides the early French school, what about America? Well, there are a lot of players that played French embouchure, but they didn't talk a whole lot about it. You know what I mean? Uh, in fact, some of the older texts when they introduce French embouchure, they present it to players as a technique that is uh, often a trade secret. So clarinet players would frequently, um, when they, especially when they played lyrical passages because they got better sound, more beautiful sound, more depth in the sound and consistency in the legato, they would slip their upper lip under and they would play the lyrical passage. They would play it double lip. And then for the more technical stuff, they would go back to single lip. Well, that's better than nothing. Um, you can still do better. So anyway, let me go on uh, with this analysis. So uh, in the pedagogical works, you find William Stubbins in his uh, The Art of Clarinet Playing or something like that, or The Art of Clarinet History. I, can't, I get those titles mixed up. Uh, but Stubbins said, Double lip players are like left-handed people. You know, if you're not going to change them. They're just here in the world, and they're just genetically that way. So, But, you know, no need to make a big deal. Just, just ignore them. That was William Stubbins. Um, in contrast, teaching at the same university um, was um, a very fine uh, clarinet player. And I won't mention his name, but he was a wonderful clarinet player, played double lip, and had a mountain of technique, and was by far the best player at the university at that time. So um, now, when you go on to other pedagogical methods, for instance, Keith Stein, it's the art of clarinet playing, is that the art of series? I can't remember by what publisher. As you can see, you're going to hear a lot of, I can't remember, <laughs> because it's a long time ago when I thought about all this stuff. Uh, but Keith Stein mentioned as a remedial technique uh, French embouchure playing. And yet he outlined all the great benefits of French embouchure playing. Um, beautiful sound, beautiful legato, um, consistent control over the sound, the nuances, the focus and density of the sound, uh, ease and response throughout the registers. And so he goes through pretty much a basic litany of how to do it. 
But then again, he falls short as to exactly how to apply it and get the optimum results. And this is one of the things I'm kind of driving at. So uh, in America, we had our major proponents, um, Ralph McLean, very famous, and a lot of New York City French embouchure players in the 1920s and 1930s, as well as Boston, very influenced by uh, Mimar. And um, again, I can't remember all the names, Louis Koyuzak. Um So it's not, um, what you find is, is that almost 100% of young players today, they start on single lip. But when advanced players, when you get to advanced players, uh, more and more play double lip. And then when you get to the professional players, especially the, the classical players, you find that percentage of French embouchure players really ramps up, you know, maybe 25, 30% or more. And a larger percentage actually practice French embouchure playing. Um, there's a recent video, and by recent I mean the last five years, of uh, Ricardo Morales uh, talking about French embouchure player and categorically stating it's better and saying that um, he would play French embouchure because it made everything better, including his articulation, uh, but he felt like he just got too many obligations playing and he just started too late to learn. Well, I, I don't really agree with that, and I think that um, maybe his approaches to French embouchure playing could have been refined to make it much much, much easier uh, to learn than he may have experienced. That's my own feeling, my own thinking. After 40, 50 years of French embouchure playing and uh, developing it and thinking about how to best learn it with a minimum of angst and minimum problems. Uh, French embouchure is a tremendous way to play the clarinet. Um, now, besides all the professionals that have recommended, and by the way, Lee Gibson, <coughs> Lee Gibson, who taught at um, uh, University of North Texas, Lee Gibson, uh, Gibson told me that he practiced French embouchure and he recommended all his students uh, practice French embouchure uh, to keep them... Uh, basically uh, keep them in line in terms of double or single lip playing, that they would get the feel, get the right feel of what it is to play without biting and so on and so forth, uh, and be able to transfer that over to single lip playing. And while I don't disagree with that, I think, why? why if French embouchure orients you naturally toward the right approach to read control, tone control, and so on and so forth. Why are you like just using it to try to keep another method that is constantly leading you astray to keep it sort of basically in bounds? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Okay, well, that's just one of the things that don't make any sense to me. Uh, now, I do have educators very hostile to French embouchure playing. They've been propagandized and poisoned for generations about how awful French embouchure playing is. And um, and I won't go into all the specifics about that. But I will give you an anecdote. And I don't want to drag this off, but you, when you discuss something, you need to discuss it in depth instead of just superficially knock stuff off uh, and leave, you know, lots of critical information out. Uh, years ago, I gave a lecture, and one of the band directors there called me up a couple weeks later. This was in Texas, and she was a trumpet player, and she had a very fine uh, middle school band. In fact, I think they were number two in the state in 5A uh, middle schools, and Texas has no, no challenger in terms of music education. Uh, fantastically good band. And she said she hated the sound of her clarinet section, and she knew when she heard me talk about tone production that I was going to teach her the things she needed to know that no one else had been able to teach her. So could I come and work with her clarinet section? And I did. Um, and 
the they weren't really the most cooperative people, you know, like young people, contrary to popular belief, are not the most flexible people in the world. So um, I said, I told her after the, the experience, I said, well, we've made some improvement here, but I think the best thing to do is to get everyone to start out that way. So that's what we did the next year. Uh, her whole uh, first year class there at, at in middle school, they started out playing French embouchure. And that's all they'd ever knew, known and all they ever, would ever learn. And it was hard for her to get the student teachers and the assistants to teach them French embouchure. Uh, so it took some cajoling. Uh, but nevertheless, we had very successful programs. And I would work with the students periodically. And she, she actually developed the skills to teach French embouchure extremely well. And she had a wonderful ear, so the you know the key to, to knowing when the French embouchure is right uh, is when it accomplishes the goal, and all the elements of the control of the tone production are working together in proper balance. And, and she could hear that, and she knew it. And that's the one thing that so many who want to teach French embouchure or band directors actually that it escapes them. They really don't realize how critical it is to be able to hear, hear what the student is doing actually physically. You can actually, once you get some experience, you can hear their correct tongue position. You can hear, not just see if the embouchure is functioning correctly in regard to read mouthpiece control. Uh, anyway, uh, her clarinet section, as good as the band was, was sort of, mm, you know, meh. I guess it's the term they use now, which I don't know. I don't really care for that term, but let's say it was it was so so. But uh, within three years of us starting from the starting that beginning set of students, French embouchure, within three years, the clarinet section was transformative. It had a beautiful sound. They played beautifully in tune. Um, they gave a a concert and presentation at the Texas Bandmasters, and her students sat at the top of um, the regional and all state and uh, local uh, junior junior bands, or, or you know the where students had to students from all the schools had to play. Um, and one of the interesting things about the whole. Um, the whole thing about learning French embouchure is that for these students was within a few miles, I think maybe 10 miles of the school, there was another junior high. And uh, they had actually been number one in the state in terms of um, uh, junior highs in this 5A. And uh, my friend's band was number two. They were very close together. Um, and they fed into the same high school. And uh, so I continued doing what I did, trying to help clarinet players and trying to care for my family and all that. And uh, one day, one of the teachers that teaches in one of these schools uh, came to me for some work. And he said, uh, by the way, did you hear what happened at um, for the freshman uh, auditions in this high school, the high school that these two middle schools fed in together. And I said, no, why should I hear about that? He said, well, I thought you'd think it was interesting uh, because uh, the freshman clarinet players from my friend's school uh, placed above all the players from the other school. And the only, uh, and even in the second band, uh, my friend's school, all the students there except one was from my friend's school. So that's kind of mind-blowing because what you have are two junior highs and equal, equal in almost every way, equal in economic situation, equal in private teachers that the students all got while they were at school. Um, and, um, you know, neck and neck in state and local competitions. And yet, 
when all the clarinet players from both schools go into one school and compete with one another, not one of the students of the other school were able to get into anything except the bottom of the second band. So that's almost as close to a test tube situation as you can possibly get. It's absolutely amazing because otherwise, think about the mathematical possibilities of all the clarinet players in this small region, only about a 10 square mile area, all the clarinet players in this small region, almost all of them for, uh, are genetically disposed to playing the clarinet better than all the rest in this one school and not one or only a handful of the other school can compete. And we're talking about when you juxtapose kids that have learned French embouchure and kids that have learned single lip only. Um, what are the other differences? Uh, well, I know the my friend's school played very good mouthpieces because I hand-finished the mouthpieces for them. And I know they had very good clarinets because they were playing my 576 clarinets that were used to win international, uh, national competitions. So I know they had excellent clarinets, but the other school did too. They lacked nothing for funds. So for me, that was kind of a mind-blowing um, event I learned about. I don't see, again, how you can get any closer to a test tube situation, uh, you know, a laboratory controlled situation as that, and remain in the real world. So uh, there are a tremendous amount of benefits, I believe, especially in teaching young players how to play French embouchure and when this teacher came to me, uh, and uh, she announced to other people, uh, as she was, uh, you know, which she commonly did, what she was doing with her clarinet section or other sections, uh, this, the other teachers that put her down, they were really vicious putting her down. What, you're teaching those students? That's a terrible way to play the clarinet, said the trombone players and saxophone players and drummers. Who were teaching the other band so obviously they were authoritative and they knew okay so much for that but she came to me and she told me she said everything you've told me so far about clarinets and mouthpieces and all this stuff has been right but i don't know about this french embouchure she said what, what are the consequences of teaching these kids so i said to my friend just let me tell you the worst possible consequences of teaching kids to learn how to play French embouchure. Here it is. They will learn to play single lip better. And everything else beyond that is gravy. But that is really the truth. Most kids have terrible mechanics and they play the clarinet with a lot of work, a lot of difficulty, and a lot of straining. Um, and I had students, when I was teaching in university, students would come in and their amateur mechanics, uh, was disturbing. And their tone production, they worked extremely hard to play. Rather than trying to get them to fight themselves to uh, overcoming the problem playing single lip, I just completely kicked the chair out from beneath them, gave them no support playing single lip, and I switched them over to French embouchure. And within two or three weeks, all the big mechanic problems, muscle problems and all that were gone. They were playing French embouchure. They were playing much more relaxed and with better sounds and better response. And again, not all of them continued to play French, uh, French embouchure but every one of them benefited from it. And that's my point here in this presentation. Uh, that if you work on learning to play French embouchure correctly, you will, there's the worst thing that can happen is that you will 
dramatically improve your single lip playing. Now, you're, you'll have the same experience I had when I was at Yale and after my first year. I decided I was going to f switch to French embouchure. Why? Because all the players that I liked and could actually listen to for more than five minutes were French embouchure players. So I thought, if they're doing that and they're getting the results that appeals to me, I'm going to do it too. So my, at the beginning of my, at the summer before my second year at Yale, I switched to French embouchure. And then I played full recital French embouchure uh, in my graduation year, second year. So I was able to do that in, what, 11 months, something like that, 12 months. Uh, so what I experienced that was really encouraging uh, when I began to learn to play, and I really had no guidance, no idea what I was doing. I finally went to Cal Opperman in New York and worked on it. Uh, but I experienced a better tone, better and more consistent tone color from register to register, automatic interval response that I had to work for and make changes for when I played single lip, um, among other things and better ability to play in tune um, and to adjust very quickly to make response and to make tuning. Uh, but the main thing that was a appealing to me at that time was just a more beautiful sound. And I think if any of you tried this um, and worked on it, you would experience the same things. Now, I'm really committed to the French style of playing, not the new French style, which in some cases sounds like a nail being scratched across a blackboard, but it's no different than most of the stuff I hear. Uh, I'm committed to the old style of French embouchure playing and the school, the musical school of clarinet playing that resulted from that. So um, here's what I'm going to do because I've had so much experience and learned so much about how to develop this with the minimum amount of angst, with the minimum amount of struggle, the minimum amount of frustration, and experiencing the things that I experienced along the line learning, uh, including having your lips cut because you're using everything wrong, uh, and having to lay off the clarinet for several days. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an offer to any of you if you want, uh, we can do this. I'd rather do it personally, because that limits everything. But which means you know not everybody wants to come to Dallas, Texas. But if you can, we'll give you something decent to eat. But anyway, you're not come able to come to Dallas. But I want to offer to you some way that you and I can personally work together. If you're committed with this, we can do this on a Zoom call or something like that. And uh, we can arrange a few periods of, of coaching. Let me hear you and watch you play as best we can on a Zoom and see if I can help you and help you develop this correctly and develop it quickly and develop it with the least amount of frustration so that uh, you can at least have uh, a sense of how this technique works uh, actually, actually works correctly, which is not just taking your upper lip under, um, and develop it correctly so that, again, uh, anything that you develop in terms of the correct mechanics and feel of reed control with double lip playing, it's going to improve your single lip playing, the mechanics, and the way you use the energy of your face mask, this whole area right in here and how you voice and all that to control the sound and keep the sound beautiful and consistent and even and very controlled at all dynamic ranges. So I'll be glad to share that with you. It's almost impossible to do it when you're just on a, you know, a video YouTube presentation. Uh, but I think you can get a general idea from that. But if you're going to get a really clear idea, you need some individual coaching. 
So I'm glad to offer that. I'll have to charge you a little bit for it, you know, about, oh, that 50 bucks an hour or something like that, because I do have a heavy production schedule. I've got a certain amount of energy. When you're 74 years old, you, it's not like you have boundless energy, like some of these youngsters I see at, at church all the time that are just bouncing off the wall all the time. <sighs> I can't remember who said it, but boy, is it true. Youth is wasted on the young. Because I'll tell you, as you get older and wiser, you could sure use some of that energy. Anyway, if you're interested uh, in doing that, uh, give me a contact and we'll try to arrange some time to do it. And if you have, if you use Zoom and most people haven't, I sort of have, but I'm, I'd have to have a refresher on how to do it. Be glad to do it with Zoom. Uh, or any other method. Let's see, I think WhatsApp, maybe. But I'm, I think Zoom probably gives you the better quality. Uh, just have a good microphone and some good lighting. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be able to make some progress. But at the end of all this, whatever you do, let me encourage you as a young clarinet player, or even a clarinet player who's fairly seasoned, but not really happy with your playing, not as happy as you would like, um, to consider approaching the clarinet, playing single lip or double lip <coughs> with an eye, even if, if it's only with an eye, to improving your single lip playing, I think you'll find it tremendously beneficial in whatever you do in terms of working on it. I don't think you'll regret one second of the time you spend making these efforts. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And if you have any questions or any comments, put them down below. If you have any questions you want answered or any ideas about the clarinet or you want shared or whatever, any subjects, uh, give me a contact. Drop us a line at sales at redenairclarinetproducts.com. And um, I'll be happy to try to put together a video if I can answer it. I don't have all the answers, but... You know, through all these years, I pretty much know someone who, do, who does have the answers if I don't. So maybe I can help you there. Uh, but in any way, uh, in any case, these videos are for you. And so take advantage of them if you care to. Uh, we're happy here to serve you. This is why our company exists, to serve clarinet players. It was the purpose that seemed to be made clear to me uh, that what I should do instead of competing with clarinet players try to help them and serve them so that's what I've been doing in case you were confused see ya